I don't know about you, but I have a great appreciation for Brother Mike Zoucha. He has a very humble appearance. He's very passionate about the things of God. He's a very valued minister here among us. Now, seeing the theme here is the identity and the relevance of the gospel of Christ, our focus is to show how the gospel is described, not by just anybody, but by Christ and the apostles. When you hear men say, preach the gospel, what are they talking about? What is the gospel? Well, thankfully, you, will have, you surely have some answers to that question by now, as many have tackled this. What is the gospel? have given us several aspects, several perspectives on what this is. Very good answers. My particular subject is not so much what is said in the gospel, even though I will touch on that, but what the response is to the gospel. What, how do men respond to it? My main passages are not pleasant ones to read, but like any affirmation in Scripture, it's, they are ones we can't afford to ignore. The first one is in Romans chapter 10, where the Apostle Paul speaks of his desire for the salvation of Israel. In verse 16 he says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah, that is Isaiah, saith, Lord, who hath believed our report? The second one is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, which speaks of the Lord Jesus when he's going to be revealed from heaven in flaming fire, taking vengeance on all those who know not God and that have not obeyed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Which also provokes the question, what is that gospel? Well, I will share with you some good news declared in the gospel that I'm sure you are not opposed to hearing. The gospel declares the good tidings of what God has done and is doing through Christ Jesus. It declares the death of Christ on the cross for the sins of humanity, his burial, and his resurrection from the dead. The gospel declares how men can be saved through faith in Christ. The gospel tells us, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you will be saved. The gospel declares that those who believe in Christ have everlasting life. It declares that if men call in the name of the Lord, they are saved. It declares that if we must take up our cross and follow Jesus. It tells us that those who come after Christ never hunger and those who believe on him never thirst. It says that if we believe in Christ, then out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. It declares that Christ is the light of the world, and those who come to him will not abide in darkness. It tells us that unless men are born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in a more initial sense, the gospel tells us mankind needs a savior. We learn that man is sinful and condemned apart from Christ in the gospel. We learn that men must repent and turn from iniquity in order to be saved. That's why we have words like, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Come out from among them, be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The gospel teaches holiness, righteousness, purity, things we must have in order to spend eternity with the Lord. And through Christ, we can obtain these things and be saved. So as you can see, there are many things declared here in this good news, this gospel. However, we have this word obey in my main one of my main passages. Obey the gospel. Now, some may read that word obey and look at this like meeting a list of demands or following a book of rules, like the law. However, this is not like obeying the law. We do have things said in the gospel that require response or action on our part. Like it says, believe in me, come to me, follow me, abide in me. That, that, calls, that provokes a response on our part. Faith for sure doesn't balk at anything that the Lord says. However, the law was not of faith. I mean, it's to be to believe, but it didn't produce the faith that's intended to save men. Salvation involves more than completing a checkoff list. It involves more than simply following the rules, and that's all there is to it, like some tend to do in our day. The gospel brings something that the law did not bring, faith. Faith is said to come by hearing. Faith comes. That means you didn't always have it. Paul even said, not all men have faith, but those of you who do have faith, this is how you got it. The gospel is the means by which faith comes to those who hear. Now earlier in Romans 10, Paul refers to his message as this. This is in Romans 10 verse 8 says, what saith it? The word is nigh, nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith 
which we preach. Word of faith. That is, it's a message that produces faith. And it's spoken in faith. By hearing this message, men will come to know the Lord and be saved. Now again, Romans 10, we read these popular questions that were cited by one of our other ministers. He said, how shall they call on him whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. And then we get to my main passage. It's more than ever clear that the gospel is the appointed means by which the Lord draws men to himself that they might be saved. It is the appointed means by which faith is produced. Hence we read, faith comes by hearing. Believing the gospel brings the righteousness of God to us. As it is written in Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God which is by faith of Christ Jesus unto all and upon all them that believe. If men don't hear this message, they cannot be saved. That is the very thing that's being shown in these questions. How shall they call on them whom they have not believed? How shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? The point is that if men are going to call the name of the Lord, they have to believe in the name of the Lord, they have to call on the name of the Lord, but they can't do that if they don't know about him. And they're not going to know about him unless God sends messengers. It's God's message, and he's going to get the message out. Something more about the gospel because often when you get an answer, it's say, well, it's about what Christ did in the earth, the gospel, his works on the earth. Well, we're not talking about just historical discourse. We're not talking about just mere history. That, to me, just a historical approach to the gospel doesn't provoke response. I mean, I could hear all day about Christopher Columbus's voyages leading to the first lasting European contact with the Americas, but what does that provoke on my part? Does that provoke me to change the way I live and think? Does it convict me of sin? Of course not, because it's mere history. The gospel is not a historical discourse of the life of Christ, but the power of God unto salvation to them who believe. No one's going to heaven because they believe Jesus existed. Sorry, Mr. Skeptic, that's not good enough. If you're going to be saved, if you desire salvation, you're going to have to look at Jesus as more than some historical figure, some religious zealot that lived sometime early in the first century. It has to be more than that. Men must believe that Jesus is who God said he is. And who he is is declared in the gospel. That's how men will become acquainted with the real Jesus. That's how they will believe in the name of Jesus. My, the gospel, you see, it's designed to produce a response of some kind. And every man will respond to the gospel in some way, whether it be for good or bad. That's what my main passages deal with, response to what was said. And when we say respond to the gospel, again, I'm not talking about just like, follow, like going through some motions here. Men can be legally correct and morally wrong, going through the motions, hating every minute of it, wanting to do something else. I'll tell you what, when I tell my kids to clean their room, they do it, but they do it with a big scowl on their face. They're hating every minute of it. This is not the kind of pe these are not the kind of people Jesus produces, not that kind of followers. Jesus produces followers like those of the Philippians who have always obeyed. You've always obeyed. People that God worked in. That's what's produced by the gospel. The law was a covenant of flesh and blood, the administration of condemnation, designed to show men God's demand for righteousness and their own inability to obtain God's favor by their efforts alone. And I must admit, that has to be learned by experience. By following and doing the commandments of the law, men would realize they need a savior. I know you've reached this realization by experience. I need someone to help me. It would be evident that men needed to be changed within, to be given a new heart and a new spirit, to have the law of God written on their hearts and minds and to be able to be born again. Obeying the gospel, therefore, would be believing these promises and submitting to the work of the Lord. That's what I'm wanting to get at. Obey the gospel is believing the report. Now, men have heard the gospel from all ends of the earth. That's actually stated in Romans 10, 18. It says, but I say, have they not all heard? For Moses saith, I will provoke you to jail. Well, wrong verse, sorry. Yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth. And their words unto the ends of the world. That's what's revealed. So the gospel's gone out everywhere, but the responses have been different. Some believed, others did not. Similar to what happened here in Acts 28-22, when Paul spoke to the Jewish leaders 
about the kingdom of God and persuaded them of Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets from morning till evening. That's what happened after he did that. Some believed, others did not. All the men heard the exact same thing. Same words, same message. But the results were mixed. Some took interest because the message appealed to them, attracted them in some way. And so they took it into their hearts. While others, well, it, the message conflicted with them. And hence they rejected it. So men struggle with this, knowing this fact. If the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, then why do people not believe it when they hear it? If the message is the appointed means by which God draws men, then why don't they come? Men do struggle with that. But I'll tell you right now, the problem is not the gospel. Never has been and never will be. There's a reason men don't believe the gospel, and it is shown in, our, it is shown in the scriptures. Now, this question here in Romans 10, 16, this is taken from Isaiah 53. It's like, who hath believed? Lord, who has believed our report? This is recited in one other place in the New Testament, and it's by the Apostle John. In the 12th chapter of his record, what we're going to be, what's going to be declared here is not popular in our day, but it needs to be. It helps us understand what's involved in obeying the gospel and why some men do, in fact, not obey it. Here's what the passage say. This is John 12, 37 through 40. It says, but though he, that is Christ, had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah, the prophet, might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. That's the Holy Spirit. They couldn't. Not, they could not believe. Because, that Isaiah said again, he hath blinded their eyes and harden their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted that I should heal them. So the question, who hath believed the report? This is a rhetorical question with an obvious answer. The point of the question is to draw our attention to the sparse reception of the gospel. Those who believed the gospel were so sparse and few in number it looked like no one believed at all. The word went out, but no one seems to respond. It looked like no one even acknowledged what was said. No one took action. And I'm sure some here have had this experience. You've preached the word, excited about it. And then everyone just kind of goes on their own way. And it does have a discouraging effect, doesn't it? In our day, we would say it this way. Is there anybody who believes our message? Where are you? <laughs> That's kind of the idea here. It's like, is it just me? Am I the only one here? Surely there's somebody out there who is received. It's not obvious to the eye. The Lord tells us why men didn't believe. Because they couldn't. God had blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, like casting a veil over their eyes. He made the message hazy to them, so they could not perceive it. A similar truth is found in the telling of the parables. When Christ's disciples, they asked him why he spoke. Like, why do you speak to these people in parables? And he did tell them. He said, because it's given you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. He this is the further explanation, Matthew 13, 13 through 15. He says, you know, it's not given them to know because they seen, see not, and hearing, they hear not. Well, how about that for an assessment? They hear, but they don't hear. And they see, but they don't see. That was how Jesus addressed it. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah saying, By hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their hearts, their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. There are two important things to see in this. The first being that although we are to spread the good tidings like we're doing now, and we are to be instant, in season, out in season, preach the word as we are charged, it's God who opens the message up. Men not believing the report that Isaiah spoke about was not due to using the wrong words, but because God kept them from seeing it. When Lydia heard the preaching of Paul, it was the Lord who opened her heart. Jesus said no one can come to him unless it was given to them to do so. The Philippians were told that it was given to them to believe. And even in Isaiah's own account with this question, he says, To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Who has the Lord opened this up to? If we see the truth, it's because the Lord opened it up to us. Hence, we should heed to these words. He who has an ear, let him hear. 
because God's speaking. The second thing to be seen here is that if men cannot believe the gospel, if they can't obey the gospel, it's their own fault. God did harden their hearts, but like in the case of Pharaoh, the heart was already hard before he hardened it. Let's, it says that their hearts were already hard and waxed gross. Here's how a few other versions put that, waxed gross, because that's not a common phrase. Here's how Wycliffe put it. He said, their hearts have become fatted. Something has developed around that heart that wasn't there previously. The other one says, hearts have no feeling, no sensitivity, have become dull, become stubborn, become hardened, and grown callous. So God punished them by hardening them. That's the that's thing you're going to see. These are judgments. These aren't arbitrary or random. There's a reason why God does this. These people had their chance. They did have an exposure of some kind, an opportunity to take hold, but they didn't do it. It even says in the text, they closed their own eyes. And then he says, but I, and I blinded them. They closed it. They're dull of hearing. Or you could say become deaf to the message. That's them. That is their own fault. The fact is that if men don't want what God offers, he's not going to let them have it. And men don't want to understand and believe the gospel, then God won't give them understanding. Then understanding is given to those who desire it. And the disciples could testify to this. This is why the scriptures say that God would send strong delusion to those who have not received a love for the truth, that they might believe a lie. That's the cause, not received the love for the truth. Amen. And every time there's a condition like this, we know they had an opportunity. We know that they had some exposure. And the Lord gave them that opportunity to take hold. And because they rejected it, this is what happened. They closed their ears to it. And God punished them by blinding them to the truth. It's a condition that they brought upon themselves due to having their affections set on things of the earth and walking in the flesh and being carnally minded. What does that tell you about the state of our own country? In America, when you think obey the gospel, you do not think of the United States of America. I let you know I don't. The church has grown more and more carnal, dull, and lifeless. The word is being corrupted by flawed teaching. Sinful living, promoted more and more, and good and holy things openly despised and rejected. The name of God being more openly blasphemed among, among our nation without any fear of consequence. Godless laws imposed on the people. Sectarianism and division, daily increase, with no sign of harmony or agreement in sight. Like you say, the battles span as far as the eye could see. It looks like there's no sign of it ending. So why is it like that in America? Now, one would say, well, because the gospel's not being preached, and I agree, it most certainly isn't. God works through his message, not when one men have made up. That is definitely true. But you must ask, why isn't it being preached? Why can't men see it? I believe the nation is the way it is because God has, in fact, like in this, these passages, thrown a veil over the people's eyes. I believe God is judging the nation and giving men over to their own lusts, which you know sodomy is increasing in the nation. And in Romans, that condition exists when God gives men over to vile affections. It's a sign of divine abandonment. And this so happens to grow in our nation. Very troubling. I believe a great falling away is taking place, which would take place in the last days, it says. Such a condition, I'm sure, causes us to remember what Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, 4, 3, and 4. He says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. <laughs> Men are unable to believe the gospel due to their own desire to hear other things that feed their own lusts. In a country like this, we can ask, just like Isaiah did sometimes, I'm sure, who has believed our report? But in another sense, we don't ask that question. This is not to say there's no remnant. I know some people when I hear something like this and be like, well, what's the use? Why even bother speaking it? This is not to say there's no remnant. And this is not to say that the gospel's not being preached anywhere at all. Else, how would we be here? The Lord has shown mercy to us <laughs> in such a situation. The fact that we're here and we're growing is a testimony that the gospel is still at work and still working in those who hear. Such an environment should be, make someone all the more zealous to preach the gospel. It really should. This should not discourage you from preaching, but it should just give you all the more incentive to preach it because there are people seeking. There are people who are not content with the way things are. 
We're all in that category. Lot, all of us came out of that category, not content with lifeless, soulless, Christless religion. And so the Lord was merciful to us because of that. So I say keep preaching, lest more become hard due to an unbelieving and godless environment. The result of not obeying the gospel will be experienced in total when Jesus comes back, which was in my other passage, taking vengeance on those who know not God. Just to comment, the know not God, this doesn't mean like I've never heard of him. That is talking about refusing to know him. That's why some translations say that. It says, taking vengeance on those who refuse to know God. <laughs> Do not acknowledge God, don't recognize God, and are not acquainted with God. If it is not knowing God due to not believing the gospel message, which is how we know God. This is how we become acquainted. This is how we recognize God. It's by the gospel. You respect the gospel, then you reject the knowledge as well. If they truly understood, if they truly were acquainted with the Lord, they would cease from sin. If they truly understood his nature and purpose, they would not continue in sin. But because they don't know him, they don't love him. And since that, they don't ignore his calls to repentance. Such a status is very unfortunate and will cost them dearly. But then we get to the other part. What kind of reaction does the gospel have on a tender heart that the Lord can work with? That's the kind of heart that God opens, <laughs> a tender one. What kind of effect does the gospel have on one who is of a broken and a contrite spirit? Think of the response of those who are at Pentecost, who, after hearing the message, being pricked in their hearts, asked, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Right there is a perfect example of what is involved in obeying the gospel. After hearing the message, they submitted themselves to the Lord and showed a very open willingness to do whatever would be said to them. We're ready to do what the Lord says. Yes. Amen. They, were, they, were just, they were ready at that point. Paul told the Romans how he thanked God that they were the servants of sin, but they obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine that was delivered to them. That also tells you something about obeying the gospel. It isn't simply going through the motions. Obeying the gospel is genuine, sincere, it's real. It's the result of tenderness and sensitivity. Amen. No one pretends to obey the gospel. Yeah. Well, what does the gospel tell you to do? Believe. Do you pretend to believe? Do you, just, is that something you can really do? In, no, it's something you can only do for real. You really believe or you just don't. Think like the disciples. who, so When hearing the Lord said, I will make you fishers of men, they just dropped their nets. And they went. They could hear. They heard. That's obeying. That's like a, an example of obeying the gospel. The Lord commands believe. He says come. You just do it. <laughs> Fully enter into the work. All who have obeyed the gospel must realize that it's by God's power that they did so. When the scriptures say he who has an ear let him hear. He's talking about a capacity to hear. What the Lord says. Now, some can hear and understand, while others can hear the same words and not understand. Jesus said, like, why don't you understand my speech? Even so, you cannot hear my word. You hear it, but you can't hear it. That's what he said. Men confirm they have this capacity by obeying the gospel, Amen. which is believing the gospel message. Men do not believe the gospel through human intellect, trying to weigh its message through human reason and logic. What do you think? The things declared in the gospel transcend human logic. It doesn't make sense to the flesh. <laughs> so this cannot be the means by which we come to a consensus that it's true. We just believe it. This is why the scriptures say, hearing comes by the word of God. And this is one of those passages I really wish was quoted more precisely because it's often misquoted. They say, faith comes by hearing the word of God. This isn't what it says. If you had a book of most misquoted passages in the Bible, I'm sure that would be in the top ten. It says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And hearing. Hearing comes as well. The capacity comes to us. It's not in us naturally. It's something given by God. Amen. From one aspect, this is God working through his message, the gospel. And from another aspect, it's been given the capacity here by God's own authoritative word. He gives it to you. So what have you concluded? How did you respond to the gospel? Did you obey or did you refuse what was said? 
And if you do believe and understand the gospel today, you don't have your own intellect to thank, but the Lord Jesus himself, who is the author and finisher of our faith. What you do see was given you by God. If God blinds men, he enlightens men too. Now my final point here is that the gospel, when it is spoken, reveals the hearts of men. If men have tender hearts, the gospel is going to bring that out. If men are hard, stubborn, the gospel will bring that out too, right to the surface. Think of the parable of the seed and the sower. The sower, he sowed on different ground. You had thorny soil, stony soil, wayside, and good ground. The wayside, the birds just snatched it right up, flew away. You get the thorny ground, the thorns choked out the word as it grew, ceased it. Stony ground, it, some growth was developed, but the root didn't get far enough down. The stones kept that root from getting down in, deep into that soil, and it was easily uprooted during trial. And then there was the good ground that yielded much fruit. Each of these represents a response to the gospel. The type of soil may not have been obvious to the eye. You probably couldn't see much of a difference at all when the seed was sown. But the seed confirmed what kind of soil it was. Now you look at that from this perspective, my main topic, it's like that obeying and not obeying the gospel. When you read they have not obeyed, you could read that to not all the ground is good. You could look at, obviously the negative response to the message is like stony, thorny ground where the seed doesn't make much growth. However, believing the gospel is like falling on good ground. Much growth takes place. Amen. I say this to show you that spreading the gospel is not only to save, seeing that not all believe it. I mean, that, that is something you have to consider. The gospel is going out, but not everyone's coming. So what else is this for? Another reason the gospel is spread is so that the hearts of men might be revealed. It is so those who are tender can be saved and that those, so those who are hard can be without excuse. You have come and believed due to hearing the gospel, but that is a personal testimony to you how powerful the gospel is. Seeing the gospel has produced faith in you, it can definitely produce faith in others. So I exhort you, keep preaching the gospel and expound it to those who you come in contact with. As long as it is the Lord's message, you can be confident the Lord will work through it and get results. Amen. This shows us that... This, this also moves us to keep preaching the gospel in our gatherings. I know people have said, like, no man should hear the gospel twice. Everyone should hear it once. Bunch of intellectual gibberish. This is not true. I do not want to hear this. I want to keep hearing the gospel. Can you imagine, like, someone bringing out a delicious plate of food, something, you oh, best thing you've ever had, and you take one, you take one bite. Oh, it's listen, they take the plate away. That's it? Well, that'll be twenty ninety nine, dollars sir. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't know. I want the whole dish. And I want seconds, too. Well, this, this would be absurd. Well, this is why I think people do in the church. They bring them in, it sounds really good, and then they just take it away. All right, we're, we'll bring in the next one. We'll give them another taste, little tiny teaspoon. We don't want teaspoon amounts. We want all you can eat. And that's what we get in these gatherings, for sure. Everyone is filled. Jesus promises that, too. Those who hunger and thirst, they shall be filled. God forbid we do something that doesn't fill his people. Now, I'm not trying to say don't preach to the lost. We're not going to say that, God forbid. We were lost at one time. So we definitely encourage that. The point is that what gets you in keeps you in also. If the gospel, if you, if you came out of sin when you heard the gospel, that is what you did. You heard it and it brought you out. You made a departure of some kind then continuing to hear the gospel will keep you from going back. Amen. If hearing the gospel enlightened you to the truth, yeah. it opened things up. Oh, I see things differently now. Uh -huh. Well, then continuing to hear the gospel will cause more insight, more enlightenment. Does everyone see everything as soon as they walk in the door? I don't think so. There's more progress to make, more places to explore, more places to grow. So keep preaching this message to each other, believing the things declared, that's the thing. You, you see, obedience isn't a one-time thing either. It's, we, we'd still have that admission, believe. As we continue to hear the gospel preach, believe. Take it in. Take it to heart. And you will act. So I thank God you have obeyed the gospel of Christ, else you wouldn't be here. And I encourage you, keep moving to a, on to perfection. Keep the faith and stand fast in that liberty, brethren. 
I, for one, am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Amen.